Welcome, everyone. I first want to acknowledge all of you for taking the time out of a Sunday afternoon to, to be here in solidarity around protecting Watsonville Community Hospital as a critical resource in our area. Just to introduce myself, my name is Jennifer Holm. I have worked at Watsonville Community Hospital in the intensive care nursery as a registered nurse since I graduated from Cabrillo College in 2005. My youngest child uh, was born at the hospital, surrounded by family. The family that is directly related to me, but also the remarkable colleagues who truly have become family by choice. I am now also a Cabrillo College nursing instructor. And the welcome that our hospital gives to our students, the opportunities that they have to learn and develop their practice, is an invaluable opportunity for the community to be served by those from within the community itself. To me, the heart of what is special about our hospital really is each and every one of you. Those who have been patients, those who have visited patients, those who have cared for patients, and those of you who have advocated for patients. Today, we'll hear from nurses who will give a, a brief rundown of the history of the hospital, describe a community health assessment, areas of concern. We will also, um, also on the panel, are of course Watsonville City Mayor Francisco Estrada. We have um, Dr. Joe Gallagher. We have Dory Rose Inda, CEO of Salud Par La Gente, and DeAndre James, CEO of the Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust. We will also have a question and answer comment period, and we have anticipated that there may be a large number of questions and comments. So we took a page from a town hall that um, Secretary of State Alex Padilla and County Clerk Gail Kel Pellerin had about voting rights last year, and we're asking those of you who have a question or comment to fill it out. Our moderators, Alisa Rona, Executive Director of the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County, as well as Maria Elena de la Garza, um, Executive Director of the Community Action Board will be compiling and organizing the questions and comments, grouping similar types so that we can address as many issues as possible in the time that we have available. So if you haven't picked up a card, um, we have some nurses who will be filling them out. We will be, you know, gathering them probably after the nurses speak, um, and then while the rest of the panel is introducing themselves, and then we'll head into the, the discussion. If there are a large number of cards that we can't get to, we will be following up. So please put your contact information so we can provide that to you. We'll then close, and there'll be refreshments in the community room. Felipe, did you want to welcome the community as well? My first time up here, sorry. <laughs> I too wanted to welcome folks up here as well. My name is Felipe Hernandez, uh, Watson City Council member. Uh, and I appreciate everyone, you know, being here. And this is what's great about our community that, you know, the city hall is filled up on a Sunday afternoon. This is what community is about. Uh, so thank you for being here. You know, our community has a history of coming together when there's a time of need. Uh, from earthquakes to labor strikes to floods, uh, the community always comes together to help those in need. You know, the community should always be concerned when the nurses are out in the community, in City Hall, uh, instead of the hospital. Um, nurses you know, their primary job is to take care of the community. And so when we're sick, we go to the hospital and they bring us back to health. Right now, we as a community have a responsibility to help the nurses at this time in need, when they're in need. I think that as a community, we need to make sure that, that the nurses are well taken care of. You know, the, the nurses and the workers at the hospital 
are the heartbeat of that hospital. They're the ones that make it run. So let's come together. Let's ask the pertinent questions about the new ownership and about our local health care system. We all have a connection to this hospital. We all have a family member or a friend that works there. I myself was also bor born there. All my brothers were born there. My sister was not born there. My sister was born in Santa Cruz because my m mother didn't want to cross the picket line at that time. <laughs> so let's give the nurses and let's give, you know, our community a big round of applause and welcome them. Thank you, Felipe. So as somebody who serves on the Pajaro Valley Unified School District uh, Board of Trustees, I know that many of our elected officials are here in their capacity as a community member rather than in their publicly elected roles. But I wanna take a moment to acknowledge a few people. And I know that somewhere either here or in the other room, Dominic Dursa is here representing Robert Rivas, a California State Assembly member for District 30. Dr. Ferris Sabah, Superintendent of the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. From the Cabrillo College Board of Trustees, we have Dan Rothwell and Adam Spickler. From the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees, Danny Dodge Jr. and Kimberly DeSerpa. From Watsonville City Council, of course, our Mayor Francisco Estrada and Felipe Hernandez. Aurelio Gonzalez, Rebecca Garcia, and Trina Kaufman Gomez. If there are any elected officials that I did not see, um, please stand and briefly introduce yourself with your name and in your office. Is there anyone I missed? Okay, good. Well, with that, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Roseanne Ferris, and I've been a registered nurse in this community for the past um, 23 years. I work at Watsonville Hospital in the critical care department. And I'm just thrilled to see all of you guys here today coming together as a community. So I'm going to present the history portion just to give um, some, some information about the history of Watsonville Community Hospital. So over a hundred years ago, in 1895, Dr. P.K. Waters came to the Pajaro Valley to build Watsonville Hospital, a five-room five sanitarium next to his home on East Beach Street. His vision was to improve health care for our community and to promote modern medicine. Having served its purpose and needing replacement, a group of local doctors initiated the drive to build a new hospital. In 1938, they invested to build the new hospital, which was on Monte Vista Avenue, and sold stock in the community to fund this venture. Right after World War II, the maternity wing was added by selling additional stock. In 1956, the Ford Foundation paid to expand, remodel, and add a laboratory to the hospital. As a nonprofit hospital, income was returned to maintain and operate the facility. The board of directors at the time, 23 physicians, one banker, one lawyer, two service league members, who were all well-established members of the community. The pride in the hospital was, the, was an important factor in its success. In 1965, our population had grown, requiring the new facility that was built on Green Valley Road. $3.2 million was needed to build this hospital. $400,000 was borrowed, the community raised $600,000, and the remainder came from federal and state grants. The community raised more than was borrowed. The community valued having a cutting edge facility, raising a total of $638,235, which was the largest amount raised in the history of the Pajaro Valley. The people living in Watsonville Community Hospital's service area looked to the hospital to care for their needs. Likewise, everyone in that area gave special attention to the needs of the hospital. The people of the Pajaro Valley have always supported the hospital. This can be seen by the repeated contributions to the hospital year after year. In 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake devastated our community. 
Small community hospitals were already experiencing financial challenges. Even with the FEMA assistance, the earthquake had a devastating effect on the hospital that significantly contributed to the need to sell the hospital. Prior to the initial sale in 1998, the community lost inpatient drug and alcohol rehab unit and the inpatient medical surgical rehab unit. The Pajaro Valley Coalition to Save Community Health Care was a group of community advocates that formed for the purpose of safeguarding acute care, particularly charity care, and keeping the ER open. The hospital board at the time worked with the Attorney General and succeeded in keeping charity care. Dr. Stanley Hyduke was one of the board members, and he was instrumental in securing the emergency room stayed open. However, the most important item that they secured for the future was the right of first refusal. Eventually, 20 local people from all walks of life were appointed to the new Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust. What they shared in common was that they valued and worked towards ensuring adequate access to health care for residents of the Pajaro Valley. When a nonprofit hospital is sold to a for-profit corporation, it requires the Attorney General to ensure that the health care needs of the community are met by the owner. One of these needs is to protect health care for the poor. At the time, the Attorney General required the existing contracts for indigent care to be maintained. And these protections are lost once the hospital is for-profit facility. In 1998, Community Health Systems, a nationwide for-profit hospital chain, purchased the hospital and made many promises to improve and grow health care services for our community. Later that same year, CHS laid employees off across the board. This was the first of several rounds of layoffs. CHS owned the hospital from 1998 to 2015. During that time, the community witnessed the closure of the oncology, oncology unit, home health agency, including mother and baby home visiting program, Sweet Success, a diabetes support program for pregnant women, the outsourcing of billing and coding departments, resulting in significant loss of jobs to this community. In 2015, CHS spun off the hospital to its subsidiary, Quorum. Under Quorum, the cardiac catheterization lab has been closed for two years, and the hospital stopped using 30% of its available beds, effectively turning away patients, forcing them to seek care in other communities. The Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust was formed with the excess proceeds of the initial sale for the purpose of safeguarding health care needs of our community. As a protection, the PV Trust has the right to match a potential buyer's offer and purchase the hospital, thereby returning it to the community as a community hospital. In talking with the community, I got a sense that people loved this hospital. At some point after it was sold, there was a disconnect of the community to the hospital. Those ties were no longer. You can see, the you can see this by the donor plaques that represented decades, from the, decades of support from the community that have been removed from the walls of the current hospital. We need to regain that pride, and we do this by taking the responsibility for this being our community hospital again. Thank you. Hello, and thank you all again for being here today. My name is Amy Groters. I'm a registered nurse at Watsonville Community Hospital in the emergency department. I have been a staff member there a little over a year. I came as a traveler, immediately noticed that there was something special about this community hospital and about the community of Watsonville. So I decided to stay and make it my permanent job. What I will be going over today is the health assessment of Watsonville and our community. 
Some quick demographics. The population of Watsonville is greater than 53,000 people. 84% are Hispanic, 11% white, and 2.9% Asian. The poverty level within Watsonville is a key determinant when assessing community and individual health. More than 30% of total households in Santa Cruz County do not make enough to meet basic needs. In Watsonville, 15.6% of the population, that's one out of every 6.4 persons, lives below the poverty level. That is a higher than average percentage when compared to the rest of California. That means being poor in Watsonville means you're really poor. As we take poverty levels into account, we begin to recognize the impact it has on our social environment. For example, CalFresh, a food assistance program, has had a steady increase of participants from 2008 to 2015 within our county. The purpose of this program is to provide food for those who would otherwise be without. This shows us that there is a steady need of people in our community who need assistance in obtaining food. And in spite of being in a rich agricultural center, Watsonville is considered a food desert according to the USDA standards. Meaning that for many in this community, obtaining food is limited due to low income, poverty, and lack of access to affordable healthy foods. Access to health care is another determinant in health assessment of a community. Santa Cruz has a lower percentage of people carrying health insurance when compared to the rest of California. Though we can see on this graph that the primary care provider ratio to population is high, higher than the state, it does not account for retiring physicians, physicians who do not take Medi-Cal, or physicians who are unable to take new patients. That's why it's vital for organizations such as Salud Para La Gente to be in our community. One highlight is Watsonville Hospital has improved its number of breastfeeding mothers. There has been a declining rate of C-sections. There has been improvements in low birth weights of babies. There has been decreases in adverse outcomes of infants. And our nurses have noticed a decrease in number of neonatal stabilizations. What this means is that mothers and babies are healthier. This is a direct result of partnerships between our community organizations and the nurses and doctors at Watsonville Community Hospital. As we have seen from this health assessment so far, there's a large population living in Watsonville with high levels of income inequality, high levels of poverty, and in terms of health, are a population affected by higher than average rates of diseases, specifically heart disease, cancer, obesity, drug and alcohol disease, and diabetes. This staggering slide shows us that there's also an increase in suicide rates in Santa Cruz County, higher than that of the state and national levels. <coughs> With very few mental health services accessible in Santa Cruz County and even less in Watsonville, the community is greatly affected. This slide here is a graph of premature death rates within Santa Cruz County. Premature death is a death that occurs prior to the average life expectancy. As you can see, Santa Cruz has had a steady increase in the number of premature deaths. For Watsonville, these premature deaths are related to cancers, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and drug and alcohol disease, many of which, though not all, are preventable with appropriate health care services in place. The premature deaths related to suicide are often reflective of homelessness, poverty, and a lack of access to mental health services. The data from this health assessment shows that many living in this community are faced with high cost of living while living in poverty and affected by disease at high rates. As a nurse in this community, I see daily the effects that these factors have on the people of this community. I can attest that Watsonville, as well as Santa Cruz County, is in vital need of maintaining our local hospital improving services, increasing services, and not cutting or limiting services for the betterment of the people in this community. The point is this, 
Having a community hospital, which is dedicated and understands the community health it serves, is not just critical in treating people who are sick, but in keeping people healthier on the whole. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Kiche Rubalcava, and I've been a registered nurse at uh, Watsonville Community Hospital for the past 16 years. I've spent my career in the ED. Um, what I'm going to touch on today is uh, some of the concerns that the nurses have. On June 6, 2019, our community and the 620 employees of Watsonville Community Hospital learned for the first time that a brand new for-profit entity with no traceable track record of owning hospitals and unknown funding sources was apparently seeking to buy our hospital. In the Pajaronian, Halson also stated it had been working on the purchase for more than a year without any prior notice before that late date to the Pajaro Valley Health Trust, who has the legal right of refusal in the case of any sale of Watsonville Community Hospital. And there was no prior announcement or public discussions with our community and no discussion with hospital employees. As frontline registered nurses with an all too clear knowledge of what for-profit corporations have done to so many of the medical services, specialties, and our ability to give safe quality of, of care here in, at Watsonville and other communities across California and the US we were immediately concerned. One of our most immediate concerns had to do with the real, with the very real possibility of vital unit closures because of what we know of these for-profit business practices. The closure of these vital units is usually based on their profit margins without regard to our patients and community needs. Closures of vital departments and units such as ERs, labor and delivery, and critical care have risen dramatically across the country. In California, and especially in rural and semi-rural communities, emergency departments are particularly vulnerable because they are, not seen, they are often seen as not profitable enough. In 2016, because CHS was in debt from borrowing too much, to purchase too many hospitals too quickly, it chose to offload 38 hospitals across the country to a spin-off, Quorum Health Corporation. Watsonville was one of those 38 hospitals. And like CHS, Quorum also used the rural model as its business strategy, implementing the same policies that prioritize profits over patients. We can see this strategy in the closure of our cardiac catheterization lab after Quorum took over in 2016, and its decision to reduce the use of beds in key areas, such as telemetry, medical surgical, and critical care units. The registered nurses know we cannot afford this kind of decision when it comes to our emergency department and other vital units. From 2012 to 2015, CHS reduced or eliminated emergency rooms, trauma centers, obstetric services, labor and delivery units, pediatric units, psychiatric units, and medical detox units throughout the country. Due to the, uh, due to the CHS rural model, many of these services were the only ones available for miles, placing particular hardship on non-urban residents. In one of the most comprehensive studies on this subject to date, the California Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development studied 48 hospitals that closed their emergency room departments between 1999 and 2010. As you might imagine, closing em emergency rooms has real life consequences. It means longer response times that are dangerous in emergency situations Time is of the essence in the cases of a heart attack, stroke, and severe infection. 
The California study showed that heart attack, stroke, and severe infection for, uh, patients faced a 15% greater risk of dying in the hospital if there, was, if there had been a closure of an ER nearby when compared with similar patients at unaffected hospitals. Obst obstetric departments have also seen overwhelmingly high rates of closure. Between 2004 and 2014, the percentage of all rural counties in the U.S. that lacked hospital obstetric services based, uh, increased from 45% to 54% due to the hospital OB unit closures. A key result of OB unit closures is that patients may show up at the delivery with little or no prenatal care due to the, di due to the distance of the next nearest hospital, adding to the risk of delivery, poorer outcomes, and increased risk of death. But the real bottom line of OB unit closures is that mothers and newborns pay the price for lack of, of access to medical care in their own communities. A for-profit decision that as nurses, we cannot condone. CHS has a record for the slash and burn model of buying, extracting the most profit possible, and then closing hospitals. A hospital bankruptcy and closure is one of the most serious concerns for Watsonville nurses after learning an unknown, completely new for-profit was attempting to purchase our community hospital. Hospital closures are on the rise in rural and semi-rural areas like Watsonville in both California and across the US. In fact, just as we see in trends of cutting critical units such as the ER, labor and delivery, and critical care, for-profit corp corporations have a dismal record of buying, making all they can, and then shuttering entire hospitals. We can see this trend clearly in the slash and burn business model uh, CHS has employed. After extracting all the wealth possible, CHS and Quorum typically sell the hospitals or shut them down. When CHS closed two hospitals in East Tennessee last December, a region deeply affected by poverty and a public health crisis related to the opioid epidemic, it caused an already strained healthcare infrastructure to get worse. Last March, in a letter to the editor of the local newspaper, a resident of Knoxville, Tennessee, writes that his wife had to wait for 15 hours on a gurney in the hallway of a local hospital before she could be seen by an emergency room doctor. And when he asked why it had taken so long, he was told that this was the new normal there. This was the new normal there due to, due to the health care shortage. In January, one gun, gunshot victim in downtown Knoxville who ultimately died is believed to have had a chance of surviving if it weren't for his longer wait time to get emergency medical help. Emergency departments also serve as a safety net for people with acute mental health or addiction treatment needs by stabilizing them and arranging for their transport when needed. When whole hospitals close, local capacity to address these needs disappears. The lack of a major health center or acute care hospital can create a domino effect. Doctors don't move in, hospitals are short-staffed and underfunded, and potential residents and businesses are discouraged from relocating by the absence of nearby health care. All of this affects the local economy. For the Watsonville registered nurses, the real risk of this happening due to yet another for-profit venture is just too high. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francisco Estrada, 
And I have the honor of representing the good and hardworking people of the city where I was born and raised. Uh, for the sake of transparency, I would like to let everyone know that I'm currently an employee of the Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust as their programs officer. But I am here today speaking to you as the mayor of Watsonville and as the first servant of the people. First off, I'd like to thank each of you for being here today on this Sunday afternoon, as well as our moderators, our panelists, and, in, and specifically, the remarkable team of nurses who have worked diligently to bring the community together to have, to have this important, inclusive, and frankly, overdue discussion about the future of our local healthcare system. We would also like to thank the Health Trust, its board, and executive director for all that they have done in such a short amount of time on behalf of the Pajaro Valley community. As a mayor for the city of Watsonville and speaking on behalf of the city council, I want to assure everyone present here today that our highest priority is and will always be to safeguard the health of the community and to protect the well-being of the people we serve. And, and this includes advocating for the hospital staff and their families that have gone above and beyond for their community and who depend on the hospital for their livelihood. Since we became aware of the intent by the House and Healthcare Group, Healthcare Group to purchase Watsonville Community Hospital, the City Council and the City Manager's Office has been closely monitoring every development. We have offered the Health Trust our full support we have held multiple conversations with the uh, potential buyers to share with them the concerns of our community. And I'd like to, and each member of council has done its best to meet with residents about this complex issue. Particularly, I'd like to thank my colleague, Trina Coffin Gomez, for her leadership as a member of council, as the city's representative on the Health Trust Board, and as a former employee of the hospital in helping the city perform its due diligence. Finally, I am here today as someone who will live with type 1 diabetes for the rest of my life. As someone working to manage a lifelong disease, I do not take my health or the health of my fellow residents for granted. I can tell you firsthand how important it is to have a local health care system that champions prevention and upstream medicine, especially for our most dis disadvantaged populations. For a long time now, our hospital for a long time now, our hospital hasn't been the pride of the community that it once was. Ever since it became a private entity, I personally don't think it's been the facility that we know it can be. We have a unique opportunity today to collectively discuss and begin building the inclusive healthcare system that we all deserve. Remember, at the heart of the names Watsonville Community Hospital and Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust, is community. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. And I'd like to thank California Nurses Association and the local nurses for putting on this community meeting. Um, my name is Joe Gallagher. I'm a family physician and been here a long time in Watsonville. I'm not here as a representative of the medical staff or of the hospital. I'm here as someone who worked in the old hospital and has worked in, in the, the new hospital as well. Um, certainly the hospital in Green Valley Road and prior was a had a matter of quite a bit of civic pride about it and community connection, but I'd also like to add that good medicine was practiced there. People worked hard on a daily basis to make sure the right thing was done for patients. And quality improvement was taken seriously. That was a central part of how we managed that hospital. Another characteristic of that to me is the kind of lingering characteristic of that hospital is that it was fundamentally honest. You could trust that if someone told you something, it was the truth. The culture of the leadership was also transparent and the overwhelming climate for employees was one of democracy. Employees grew as a result of working in that hospital. Unfortunately, all that was lost in the fourth quarter of 2000, or 1998. The culture of community health systems was remarkably opaque. 
Um, even board members did not have access to what was going to happen at the board meeting prior to being present at the meeting that night. You've heard about the cuts in services. Instead of presenting to the health trust the need for a cut in services, services were cut and then forgiveness was asked for. With regard to the oncology unit, there was a change in the way chemotherapy was reimbursed. And then uh, CEO Kaylor Schemberger went to the employees of the oncology unit, and as part of his description of the reasoning, he said, it's not that we're going to lose money on oncology. We're just not going to make the amount of money we, we'd like to be making. One of the most startling things that happened early on was that the new organization fired people on Christmas Eve in 1998. And when I challenged the CEO about it, he said, well, I didn't really think that was the right decision. So I knew we were in trouble when they would do something that inhuman and then not take responsibility for it. When I first heard about Halson, I looked at their website and did some internet research about the principal members of Halson Corporation. And what I found in the Orange County Register, the Orange County Weekly, and the Desert Dispatch were really quite startling. Hospitals there had great difficulty when affiliated with the members of Halson. In my opinion, the things that I read in, on the internet from those newspapers sounded worse than we had lived through for the past 20, 20 years. Excuse me a sec. So I believe it is exactly for this reason that the Health Trust has the right of first refusal. The purchase of a hospital fits squarely within its mission to improve the health care of all members of the Pajaro Valley. The philanthropy that it has pursued for the last 20 years has been a very valuable thing, but all of that has assumed that there's a functional hospital in the community. And that assumption is no longer guaranteed. It is my sincere hope that the Health Trust comes to understand that a community nonprofit hospital is the best way to reliably assure access to hospital care for the members of the Pajaro Valley. Should Watsonville Hospital falter or close, it throws the whole county health system into crisis. There is not sufficient capacity, either in the Sutter Hospital or in the Dominican Hospital, to absorb, for example, the 30,000 ER visits that occur in Watsonville in a year. I would also like to take this opportunity to say that I would be very much appreciate being the leader of a team that put, puts Watsonville Community Hospital back together as a nonprofit one that serves the community's needs, one that regains your trust, that doesn't exploit anyone in the process, and does so in a way that's financially stable. I believe my passion for this and that of all of us in the room is an important piece of a solution here. But I also believe that it's not enough. We wonder if there is technical expertise to do this, and I can assure you that there really is very good technical expertise to bring this together. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Dori Rose Inda, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Salud para la Gente, and I have lived and raised my family in Watsonville over the past 25 years. Salud para la Gente is a federally qualified health center, which means that we're federally mandated, missioned, regulated, and funded to ensure access to primary care, regardless of ability to pay and insurance. We provide those services through medical, dental, vision, behavioral health and counseling, supportive services, and various specialty services. Our medical services include 
family practice, pediatrics, and OBGYN, and specialty services that include pediatric psychiatry, nephrology, and uh, chiropractic services on site, and through telehealth services, endocrinology, dermatology, neurology, and adult psychiatry. We serve 27,000 of our community members, close to half, if not half, of our community, all of whom count on Watsonville Community Hospital as their hospital. Salud partners very closely with Watsonville Community Hospital to ensure high quality, comprehensive health care for local residents from birth until death. Since 2015, Salud has partnered with Watsonville Community Hospital by providing a 24 hour a day, seven days a week, hospitalist group to deliver almost all of the infants born in the hospital each year. This partnership allows women comprehensive perinatal services and ensures enhanced services in the areas of nutrition, psychosocial and health education, and walking hospital tours for expecting moms, daily on-site hospital-based scheduling for newborn and lactation follow-ups, and postpartum checkups at Salud's clinics, including the two who are co-located on the hospital campus. Salud's partnership with the, with the hospital ensures that all pregnant women delivering at Watsonville Community Hospital receive the same excellent standard of comprehensive care, allowing each entity to contribute its unique capacity while realizing efficiencies and promoting cost effectiveness. We partner with the hospital for, for gynecological surgical procedures, allowing patients to stay in their hometown for treatment of acute health conditions. To address substance use disorders and addiction, we partner with the hospital to ensure counseling is available on site for individuals, individual assessments of substance use allowing for a treatment plan for the moment of, of crisis in which patients are most likely to accept this life-saving service. Across most areas of care, Salud and the Watsonville Community Hospital partner um, allows for timely and seamless transfer of patients and records between healthcare providers and facilities. This reduces complications, allows for good coordination of care, and improves patient satisfaction, provider satisfaction, and patient outcomes, most importantly. Salud's demographics reflect the same of the hospital and our community. 90% of our patients are Latino, almost 80% primarily speak Spanish, and almost 80% live below the, federally, the federal poverty level. Not surprisingly, 70% of our patients rely on Medi-Cal and 10% are uninsured. A little over 40% of our patients are for farm workers and many others work in ag-related and service employment. While these workers rise at dawn and work until dusk to ensure healthy food is on our plates that keeps our, our region, our state, and our country healthy, their reality is quite different. Immigration status, race, language, literacy barrier, barriers, very low wages, and one of the most expensive housing markets lead families to rely on substandard housing, unfair or unsafe working conditions, and sometimes dangerous family relationships. These in turn result in poor physical and mental health. Salud's patients experience and this community experiences high rates of hypertension, diabetes, asthma, obesity, and musculoskeletal injury. While agriculture is essential to our region, it is also rated mo one of the most hazardous work. Farm workers face high risk of injury and illness, yet often go without insurance and hesitate to access care because of the same fears mentioned above. Recent federal policies and actions, including those threatened today, exacerbate this fear and further jeopardize a willingness to access health care. Farm workers earn a median annual wage of 20,000 a year, 10,000 below what California family poverty threshold is. 
Nearly 30% of families with children under age five in this area live below 100% of the federal poverty level. While these are very um, significant challenges and our community faces significant health disparities, we have an amazingly strong community. It is a, a very hardworking community with tremendous partnerships among government and community-based organizations and healthcare that ensure this community feels safe and is able to access as much as the services that it, as it can. The community that Salud serves and Watsonville Community Hospital serves does face many uh, health disparities and it does not fit into a formula that results in a profit margin for a hospital. In fact, without Watsonville Community Hospital caring for this community, the sustainability of all of our healthcare partners in the region become at risk. As mentioned earlier, Dominican Hospital provides significant care for the Medi-Cal and underinsured population. If it were de to be responsible for the care of our community as well, it would be unlikely to be able to sustain its services. Together, Watsonville Community Hospital, Salud para la Gente, Sutter, Kaiser, the County of Santa Cruz and Monterey, Dominican, Stanford, Natividad, CHOMP, and our other FQHC partners make sure all the needs of our communities can be addressed. Watsonville Community Hospital is a crucial partner that ensures this fragile infrastructure, and without it, the sustainability of all the others is jeopardized. This important community deserves the same health and well-being it makes possible for the rest of the region, the state, and the nation. Watsonville Community Hospital matters. This community deserves an opportunity to make sure its hospital always has the community's needs and interests at heart, and not outside investors focused on maximizing profits. A locally controlled hospital is not simple nor a sure thing. But with cross-community, cross-sector, and cross-healthcare institutional commitment and investment, it is the only promise for local, sustainable healthcare that can provide the services this community needs and that lead to a healthy and thriving community. Our community is too, too often suffers under the burden of fear and lack of opportunity to advocate for its own best interests. All of us, each of us, as concerned community members face an, uh, an important opportunity to restore service and quality through a hospital that puts the needs of our community first today and, and far into the future. Thank you. Good afternoon. DeAndre James, the CEO of Power Valley Community Health Trust. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, inviting us and being here. Uh, the mayor, city council, elected officials, uh, our nurses, uh, thank you all for being here, our community for being here. Uh, this is a, uh, I understand, a very um, large topic for the community in the last years. I want to say that the uh, Health Trust mission is to improve health and the quality of life for all people at Greater Power Valley. We envision the community in which each resident, every resident has the opportunity necessary to reach their full potential. We accomplish our mission and vision by ensuring access to high quality, culturally responsive healthcare services and supporting the community in building strong aligned health systems. We uphold this mission through our core values of respect, involvement, integrity, and equity. In regards to this topic and all, uh, our focus is to ensure that we have long-standing, high-quality health care uh, with, uh, with partners in the community for the foreseeable future. And to us, it's regardless of who, owner, who owns the hospital, the importance is that we have these services and these things that are necessary for the community. And that's been our focus the entire time of being notified from June 6th and our board and everybody in SOS have been contacted by a lot and it has been uh, you know, humbling 
uh, that uh, and that this community reaches out in this fashion and does and and is and this is the heart of the community. And uh, as the health trust, we take that very very seriously. And this is uh, not of light of heart. And we want to make sure that we have the services necessary in the community for the foreseeable future. Elisa. Elisa, I just want to, Felipe has a quick logistics announcement. A few house items. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge Council Member Lowell Hurst. They just arrived. Also, on both sides of the wall, you'll notice that there's the light switches that keep going off and on. If you lean back on those, the, they'll flick the light switches on. So be careful with the light switches. Seems like a disco in here. Also, the restrooms, just to let you know, are right outside the doors across the hall. Make a quick right and a quick left, and they're right there on the double doors. You'll see them right outside across the hall. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> and thank you for coming on a Sunday to talk about this important community decision that we are all making. I want to thank the Watsonville Community Hospital nursing staff for their informative presentation and also the community leaders who have come today to share information and to answer questions. I am pleased to be co-moderating today's discussion with this panel. I am joined by Maria Elena, who I'd like to introduce herself, please. Está prendido, ahora sí. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. I'm Maria Elena de la Garza, and I am purposely on this side of the podium as my uh, responsibility is to help bring to life the comments that um, people in this audience have. I would like you to know that I have five comments thus far, and we will still be collecting comments as we go through this part of the um, of the day. Um, I am Maria Elena de la Garza. I'm born and raised in Watsonville, and I was born in the old Watsonville Community Hospital. And um, today, uh, my plan was to be a fly on the wall to listen to what the community had to say and to learn about um, this important, be part, to hear this important conversation. Um, and I was asked by Elisa to, to help and to support the conversation. So I'm here con respeto with humility um, as a representative of the community that, that um, I am a part of. Thank you, Maria Elena, for joining us. My name is Elisa Arona. I am the executive director of the Health Improvement Partnership. We are a local nonprofit organization, and we represent the healthcare organizations here in the community. As explained at the beginning of the town hall by Jennifer, we have collected comment and question cards in English and in Spanish. And the comments will be read aloud by Maria Elena. And I will be asking the questions of the panel members. We only have about an hour left, uh, and probably a little bit less, because we are going to need some time for closing comments. So keeping that in mind, we are going to do our best to share all questions and comments. But it does mean that the, co the questions will be grouped by theme. So you may not hear your exact question, but we hope to, by theme, be asking similar kinds of questions of the audience, uh, excuse me, of the panel members. We also plan on responding to all questions at a later time. So if you have submitted a question, please also include your email address if you would like a response. I want to remind everyone that we will not have an open mic. There are so many in the room, and we really are trying to manage the time that we have. So we, ex we really appreciate everyone's respect of that process so that all questions and comments um, can be brought forward or responded to at a later time. Sure, I've covered my bases. So 
So we will start with comments from the audience. We really appreciate the hour that you've spent with us, uh, listening to this information, gathering your thoughts, and now we'd really like to share your voice. So I'm going to ask Maria Elena to come, please, uh, to the podium and, and share some of those. I am very, very concerned about the possible sale. We need Watsonville Community Hospital and its vital services. We need to reopen and revitalize our beloved local hospital. Access for the poor will be diminished because a for-profit must pay shareholders in taxes. I am concerned quality of care will be compromised. We need to protect this most valuable resource in our community. It should be owned and managed by people who are advocates for the health needs of the Watsonville community. I would prefer to see a true community hospital with a CalPERS pension for their employees. I am concerned for profit corporations buying Watsonville Community Hospital. My concern is some inflation adjusted costs 638,235 community raise funds in 65 equals 5,189,823 in 2019. Sale price in 98 was 56 million, in 2019 is 88 million. The current price equals one third of the 1998 value. When you sell a business, at such a deep discount, it is not a healthy business. With an aging parent on a fixed income, I am concerned with the reduction of care due to cuts and the possibility of a closure and distance to Santa Cruz, which risks life in an emergency situation. The concern is the new model of operations of a hospital is to fire travelers to, or excuse me, to hire travelers to staff not local people, travelers from ever state with no connection to the community here for three months and gone. I'd like to just take a moment um, to acknowledge those comments from the audience and to ask if any of the panel members have any response to any of those particular comments. I also have a more formal question if you'd like to proceed. Dr. Gallagher. In, in terms of the, the sale price being one third of the 1998 sale price, there's much of the background financing of Quorum Health, Quorum Health Systems that's involved in coming to that sale price. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first question from the audience, and it's in Spanish, and I will translate after. Yo quiero saber si las CNA van a seguir trabajando sin cortes de horas con el mismo sueldo y beneficios. Question is, I'd like to know if the nurses of the CNA are going to continue to work without cuts in hours and at the same salary and benefits under the new ownership. Oh, oh, 
I'll answer the best I can, being that, and I do want everybody to understand that I sign non-disclosures and other legal documents that will uh, limit it, some of the conversation that I can have today. But uh, any questions that I could shed a little light to, I will. In the agreement, they have bought the entire asset purchase agreement, which includes current contracts and current, um, uh, yeah, so mostly all the current contracts. And so that includes whatever is happening with the nurses as far as I know, or whatever is happening there today. Thank you, DeAndre. Please, Roseanne. Yes. Um, so just to share, I would hope so. We don't know for certain. Um, I can say that we have contracts and we don't know what will happen when we get to the table and negotiate those contracts. So I would say yes, I would hope so for the, for the well-being of the nurses and for the community. Thank you. Uh, in my conversations with the potential buyers uh, alongside uh, Councilwoman Kaufman Gomez, uh, these are some of the questions that were asked and uh, put in front of the potential buyers. And the overall impression that we that we, we got and that we were told is that they would do their best to not make cuts. And so um, what that means, uh, you know, um, Again, uh, you know, it's, it's important to, to try to, if these things were said to us, to perhaps find a way to keep them accountable, keep them honest. But uh, at the end of the day, this is a private transaction, and um, uh, we, with the best uh, that we can probably do is just continue to advocate for our families and employees at the hospital. So as a follow-up question from the audience, what assurances do we have that the hospital won't be shut down or sold? Once again, I guess that comes to me. Um, so in those contracts, there's also what the 1998 agri original agreement and covenants. Um, those are also what they have bought in that group and, and the reason why we have the right of first refusal today. So uh, I imagine there will be continued conversations around those original 1998 agreements. I don't think those assurances can be provided under any circumstances, regardless of who the owner is. I think it was mentioned um, earlier that the um, sustainability of small rural hospitals is challenging under any circumstances. Um, and, and I think uh, from some of the, what was mentioned earlier, more challenging uh, for the for-profit uh, corporations. But I, I think there isn't a way for any one of us um, to earnestly and with evidence give an assurance like that. So on a similar topic, um, there's a question, what is the mission statement of Halston Healthcare? Why did they feel Watsonville Community Hospital was a good purchase? And DeAndre, bef before you answer, I just want to share that we do have a statement from Dan Brothman, who is here with us um, this afternoon. So I'd like to ask Maria Elena to please share that. My name is Dan Brothman. I am CEO of House and Healthcare. We are excited about the opportunity to work with Watsonville Community to acquire this hospital. We have extensive experience in this area and believe we will provide a safe, comfortable, and inclusive environment for all the employees. We will be accountable to the community. We are not like CHS or Quorum. We will be accountable to the Watsonville community. We are willing to put members of, tr I'm sorry. Um, we, are, we are willing to put members of trust 
and FQHC on hospital boards. We will not close services like OB or ER. We will not lay off employees. We have great financial backing and over 90 years of experience. We are committed to mental health and expanding services. DeAndre, yeah, Can you read the question just one more time, make sure I'm gathering? Okay, what was the original question? Yeah, the original question, mm -hmm. What is the mission statement of Halston Healthcare? Why did they feel Watsonville Community Hospital was a good purchase? I don't know the mission station of Halston Healthcare. I think Dan Brothman and his team can answer that. What I can answer is that um, Quorum Healthcare has been um, trying to sell uh, Watsonville Hospital for quite some time. That has not necessarily been publicly known, and it's been shared amongst, if you, uh, in the healthcare realm, that that has been Quorum's uh, mission to sell Watsonville Community Hospital. So uh, everybody had the opportunity out in the healthcare universe to purchase the hospital, and their choice is not to or to is, is uh, beholden to that organization. Uh, Watsonville Community Hospital, I mean, Watsonville itself is a great community, so I wouldn't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to be here. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can't answer directly for Wholesome Healthcare in regards to why they felt that it was uh, a right purchase. I can only share what I've been told, which is that there were other hospitals um, uh, that Halson was uh, negotiating with Quorum in another state that fell through, and um, Watsonville Community Hospital that was then offered as an option. So that, that isn't uh, necessarily a, a prime reason, but it is background. On this topic, we're going to share a couple of related comments. I work at SLRH in Gilroy. OCH and SLRH have been bought, quotation, or stolen in parentheses, by Santa Cruz, by Santa Cruz County or Santa Clara County? Santa Clara County. SC County. After being lost by Verify who went bankrupt with three years of buying us. Don't let your hospital go through what we continue to go through. See us as a cautionary tale of what can happen when corporate entities try to run or operate community hospitals. We want an administration and owner who care about patients and staff more than profits for shareholders and CEOs. The new company purchasing the hospital will cut back services for the people of the community. We cannot allow this to happen. It is unsafe and we cannot let them play with people's lives. Okay, so on an alternate topic but related, a question from the audience. How realistic is community ownership at this time? How would it proceed? Dr. Gallagher. In, in terms of, um, let me sort of compose myself for a second. Um, before the earthquake in, in 89, the hospital had about a 65% market share in Watsonville. After the earthquake and continuing it has stayed at about 50 or 50% 50 or under. There are a number of things that need to be done to right that. One of that one of those is is to reattract the community to this hospital. There are other areas that need to be fixed. Billing and collections has been a problem under quorum so that even though bills are generated collections are very poor because of that um, Obstetrics has experienced a decrease in the number of births by, by about 20%, I guess is my, my sense. So I think there are things that are fixable. Um, there are also things that we could do here that have 
not been done and all those could be analyzed to see whether they would add to the bottom line or how they're best done. So I think there are fixes to make Watsonville Hospital sustainable. It's a sort of more complicated answer, but I think that's the best overview of it. Just in general, um, for a community hospital to go, or a community a locally controlled and governed hospital um, to move forward would require a significant partnership inv and investment from uh, the other healthcare partners in the region. That's one essential part. Um, it would require some uh, very significant um, work uh, on identifying the appropriate structure and governance, um, what authority under which it would move, and uh, that would have to happen pretty quickly. We have examples in the region um, from uh, Salinas Valley. Uh, Natividad had, has uh, also done research, at least um, while it didn't transition its structure. It did a lot of work around how to uh, move towards that. And, uh, and there's other hospitals um, outside of the immediate area that can provide examples and technical assistance around how to do that. But I think those are the really key general um, steps that would have to happen very quickly. Okay, thank you. I'd like to share another comment that has been provided by the Halston representatives that are here in the room today. So I'd like to invite Maria Elena to share that, please. I look forward to working with this community. I grew up in McAllen, Texas on the Mexican border. I understand an agricultural community. I understand the importance of curing for the underprivileged. Halston is not publicly traded and will never be. We have the ability to make decisions with the community. We will not cut services. We will grow the services. We want to employ locals, prefer not to staff travelers or registry. We will maintain current staff and not cut pay. Okay, so first of all, I wanna really thank the audience for participating through all of these comments and questions. They are grouping, but as you can see, we're doing this in real time but I want to make space for some of the other comments and questions that are coming related to health services in the community and those needs. Um, but I also want to remind everyone that the clock is ticking and we now have 25 minutes left for this portion. So I hope it doesn't seem like we're rushing through some really important uh, topics, but there are quite a few different kinds of questions and comments that are coming here. So on the topic of health services, um, there are some questions related to um, the ability to add mental health services for pregnant women, as well as substance abuse services. Um, there's also a question, um, in addition to indigent care, what commitment to specialized care to minority communities like the transgender community and what commitment to progressive reproductive rights will be asked of future ownership regardless of private or nonprofit, especially in light of the Trump administration's efforts on religious liberty and those potentially life-threatening impacts on these and other marginalized populations. I, I want to answer it as a general question, and I, I, I think Dory can probably shed more light because this is her uh, direct work. But in, in regards of services, I think uh, hearing these things is, is the most valuable point of that hearing that somebody's been marginalized or hearing that there's not services for certain dead sexes is, is really what this meeting, uh, one of the hearts of this meeting is. So we can get that as, as from the health trust perspective to make sure, uh, regardless of ownership, that uh, we incorporate those thoughts and those things into uh, our, in our mission of you know, making sure that we have long standable health care in the community. So I, I definitely cannot answer on behalf of the hospital, but I can say that um, mental health and substance use services and transgender care um, are 
essential services for the most vulnerable in our community. Salud para la gente, as I mentioned earlier, partners closely with the hospital to ensure that substance use and mental health services um, are available. And um, we also provide a significant amount, we're a growing amount of transgender care. Of, um, I, in terms of the hospital, um, these, are, these are exactly the kinds of services that require a community commitment and are not necessarily tied to uh, an ability to um, get reimbursement and make a profit. Uh, Salute as a community health center, of course, is committed to and um, invests significant resources towards those services and works closely with the hospital to make sure we can leverage um, the most uh, effective use of funding and efficiencies to reach as many people as possible. A hospital that continues to um, increase access to those services because they are uh, really, um, I would say, just beginning services. They have a lot of room to grow and increase to actually meet the need. Um, would take a very strong commitment to um, to providing the services regardless of the the uh, uh, ability to bring in profit margin around them. And in fact, um, they would be probably areas of investment rather than revenue. I'm going to jump in and, and share some comments from our community. Public health is very important in this community, especially because of our economic disadvantage status. We need to make sure everyone has access and quality service, equal access for all. There is a tremendous need for psychiatric care in a hospital setting, both inpatient and outpatient. NAMI requests Watsonville Hospital address this, whether using existing facility or building a new facility on the large Watsonville campus. With home base health requirements for Medi-Cal, I am concerned if departments like diab di diabetes is closed and they cannot partner with our local hospital, the domino effect will be lost funds to clinics. My greatest concern is compromising everyone's right, not privilege, everyone's right to quality safe healthcare offered by an accredited hospital, community hospital. To various communities in California, other healthcare systems have made identical commitments when purchasing hospitals or merging hospital systems. For example, no cuts or no layoffs. Eventually, when the layoffs and cuts come, there is a long list of supposed justifications. It's abundantly clear that Watsonville is in dire need of all of its services, the no layoffs and no cuts need to be in writing and with enforcement provisions to protect this precious community. Do the panel members want to respond to any of those particular comments? Um, I'm I'm happy that that these concerns are being raised right now, and uh, I'm happy that our, uh, the potential buyers, whoever that might be, are listening today. Um, uh, I'll say that you know, uh, after my conversations with the potential buyers, they said everything I think we wanted to hear, right? But w what does that really mean, right? I have no idea what that really means because. Um, the last thing that any of us want is is not to have a hospital and that that precious precious resource in the community. Um, so more than anything, I, I, I'm just I want to thank the potential buyers for l making it public some of these things that were said to us in private. Uh, I mean, my biggest concern is, as I said, keeping them accountable. You know, they're saying they're not going to do these things today. But what happens if they if something does happen tomorrow, right? What are we what what resources what recourses do we have as a community to make sure that the 
livelihoods of our employees are kept safe. So um, I, I'm just really appreciative of these comments. Thank you. I will add that the uh, only true legal resource in that, it was what was created in 1998. It is now 2019. So uh, our lawyers and things like that have been going through that because not only has you know, Watsonville changed since that, healthcare has changed since 1998. And so um, as far as accountability, uh, what's in those documents and, and how we go through those documents, is, is the only true accountability we have uh, at this point. I'm not saying there is anything else open to that, but at this point, those original agreements, which that group has agreed to take on, so I want everybody to understand that. And so how our legal team is walking through that to make sure those things, uh, and so hearing these things, as I, as I mentioned, is very valuable in those conversations of things that we are, that we can hold uh, that group accountable to or anybody that owns the hospital. Let me just make sure that's the case. I just want to go back to the question about um, substance use and um, mental health and uh, transgender care. Um, those areas, I know I mentioned that Salud works in them, but they, they rely on partnerships uh, across the county with the counties and with other community-based organizations um, and health uh, entities. and. Um, the, I just want to touch a little bit on transgender care because there's been a reduction in access um, recently. Salud's transgender care um, includes uh, uh, what's called gender affirming um, care across uh, all ages, both um, under 18 and adults. We do not provide um, gender-affirming hormones for under 18. We do refer those to UCSF and to Stanford. And, um, and are we, we're currently working on uh, a program that connects specialists with on-the-ground practitioners um, to help train our providers and therapists to increase our, our ability to serve that, um, those healthcare needs. Uh, but in terms of um, gender-affirming surgery, it hasn't been available in our county yet. We do refer out for that. So I just wanted to answer that. And earlier I talked about a lot of the partnership around substance use and mental health. Thank you for that clarification, Dory. Um, so there are a number of questions related um, to the trust role um, and the right of first refusal um, and particularly, um, how much financial support would be needed for the trust um, to exercise the rate of first refusal and acquire Watsonville Community Hospital? Yeah. And um, I guess also related to that question is the history of the hospital and its original sale and some clarification around why it was originally sold and if a, the community model is, is viable. No, thank you for the question. I, I'm only going to state facts and, and once again I said it, there or uh, due to legal and other things there's limited answers to my questions. Um, but I will say this, the Health Trust, and this is public information, is a $17 million asset organization. The sale of the hospital is $45 million. 45 days, <laughs> and the difference between $17 million and $45 million is that. Now, what does it take to own a hospital? I think there's um, other people in different ways in different parts of the, the, the country they can tell us exactly what it takes to run uh, a hospital but I just want people to understand that that's where the trust is at it's a 17 million dollar organization it's a 45 million dollar uh, ask of the sale then what's the other I want to make sure I'm clear on the other part of the question was the history of, of the original set. sale right so the history 1998 and I think me and uh, Dr. Gallagher had a nice conversation about this. Um, the hospital was in a good position. 
um, the um, the earthquake um, happened, and then the hospital and the community was put into a very serious financial situation. Uh, FEMA was not helping. A lot of things were not in the right order. They were had to make a decision. They had to make a decision to say, what is the best thing for the community at this particular point? So a group of community members and others weighed in on selling the hospital. And that was the best option for it at that time. I will say this in defense of anywhere, that the community has had a hospital for 20 years. And a lot of communities, as we have hear from others and, and around the country, have closed during that same time. So we might not have, the, the thought is that we have not probably had the best partnership with CHS or Quorum during that time. But there is a level that a hospital was open during that time. But it is, in 1998, it was a very financial decision to keep a hospital happening in the community. But what happened also during that time, which is great, that the community came together and said, let's protect the community at the same time and created the health trust. Thanks for the opportunity. I wanted to add to my previous answer. Um, two, two parts about this. One, about what does it cost to own the hospital. The asset purchase agreement is a public document. It's available in the reference section of the library. And part of that is that my best understanding and recollection is that at 45 days, it requires a non-refundable 10% deposit to start moving forward. The other thing about the viability of the hospital in 1998, the details were a little fuzzy to me. So I called the fellow who was the CFO at the time. His name's John Nacol. And he said the finances for the hospital had been lean for a number of years, but it still had reserves. It was able to pay its bills. It had not defaulted on the municipal bonds that were assured that required financial reserves. What happened after the earthquake was that FEMA granted money for this, the construction of the building but not for any property on which to put the building. So in order to purchase that, the board made a decision not to go into additional debt, but to sell. To, to sell. Um, and, and so I'm very happy to get the opportunity to clear up the misconception that the hospital in 98 had financially failed. Um, so. You talked to Gallagher. And as a follow-up question, um, there could not the trust partner with Santa Cruz County Health Services and possibly Kaiser Permanente or other health systems partners in the community? Uh, as Dory kind of alluded to earlier, that is, um, that is a possibility um, that that could happen. That would take um, a lot of different things to happen in the community at one point or another. Uh, to happen, uh, to happen within um, a quick time frame, everybody would have to roll up their sleeves and make that happen, and those individuals have to come uh, prepared to do a lot. So there is a possibility, or that could be a possibility of happening, um, but I, I want to know the real the realisticness of that happening is a lot, uh, and a lot of people get in the room and partnering and doing that very quickly. And I, I, th I do think that DeAndre's answer is referencing a general partnership with healthcare partners, not necessarily specific to the two that were mentioned. Um, and, and I think the question about how does, a, how does a locally controlled or governed hospital go forward and whether or not it's viable. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are examples of how it's been done successfully as close to us as uh, Salinas Valley Memorial. And, um, and if healthcare partners, um, not just those that were mentioned, but those, uh, those others that are in our community, all the way from the North, um, Stanford, Sutter, Kaiser, Dominican, um, the, both of the counties, uh, Natividad, Champ, they're the partners that provide care for this community. And that is the key, uh, really, to whether or not, as you heard the discrepancy between um, the assets that 
uh, the, that DeAndre shared of the trust and the actual purchase price, that would be only the beginning of what's necessary to be able to open and run a hospital. So there would have to be a significant commitment on behalf of the healthcare partners, uh, some or all, in order to, um, to act as quickly as, as DeAndre just mentioned and uh, move forward. But there are examples of that happening, and, uh, and it certainly, at least in, in, in my opinion and the research that I've done, does promise the ability to make sure community interests are always um, at the heart of the direction of a hospital. I have another question in Spanish. Me gustaría saber cuándo van a empezar los cambios que los nuevos dueños van a hacer. Van a avisar con tiempo esos cambios. So the question is, I would like to know when any changes at the hospital of the new owners would, would happen, and will they give us time to know about those changes? Uh, well, the um, we have to uh, enact or sign the ROFR uh, July 21st is the time. Oh, the right of first refusal, sorry. We have to sign or not sign the right of first refusal July 21st. Um, after that point, then the official sale of the hospital would have to take place between whoever that is, or being us, or being that. There's time between it. There's, uh, so the actual sale would have to take place. After the actual sale takes place, then there is the strategic planning and the operations and things like that. So I would imagine that um, you're a little bit of uh, time between uh, knowing when things are going to happen or not happen and, and that I think right now we're in the process of sale itself. Uh, let's figure out the sale itself uh, and the uh, accountability, as the mayor mentioned, of that sale. And then there is the operations and, and those things of the hospital to follow. If I could uh, just add one thing, um, and DeAndre uh, and I have um, sort of mentioned it a little bit, but the 45-day window is, is not enough time. It's 45 days is not a lot of time to be able to think about this, to talk about this, to process this. And uh, maybe there were an opportunity to extend that window for future uh, situations like this. I think it'd be to the benefit of the community for sure. So respecting all of your time, um, we are going to close the comment and question period now. I'd like to just thank Maria Elena de la Garza for joining me um, here, co-moderating co the panel today. And I'm just going to end, and this is a way to pass the baton back um, to Jen. Um, what does the trust and the community need from the members of the audience today toward um, next steps? Music. <laughs> so while the sale of the hospital does raise concerns, I do want to emphasize the power we have as a community in raising our collective voice. One of the ways that we can demonstrate that is through a petition. And the Watsonville registered nurses have, you know, been passing around, you know, passing that around there. They have it available at the back table. We're asking for your signatures. The petition includes a call to action for the health trust to purchase the hospital through the, the right of first refusal, as well as a community benefit agreement for any and all future owners of the hospital. Please take a moment to add your name and show the support that the community has for the health trust in taking a lead role in acute care in this area. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here and taking an active interest in our community's health care. We will have refreshments you know, in the community room, but I also want to invite everyone to gather refreshments and then step outside for a group picture of all of the coalition, and that includes all of you, in a historic moment. With that, the formal portion 
of our town hall is concluded. Thank you.